Um, so I want to just briefly talk a little bit about who I am. So I'm a documentary filmmaker and a television producer, uh, a writer and a professor at the Medill School of Journalism. Um, human rights and social justice, environmental issues are really my focus, um, but they're also my, my passion. I feel to be a documentary filmmaker and, and focus on an issue and, and oftentimes risking your life to tell a story, you have to feel passionate, you have to believe in the subject, um, and you have to you know, be able to, to follow through on a story as it, as it changes and maybe becomes more um, more complicated. I often do do everything, so I'm a, um, a cinematographer, a director, a producer, editor, kind of all rolled up into one. Um, and you can actually see me, this is a picture of me um, working in Afghanistan in Logar province, um, filming a scene for the, the documentary Saving Me Sinek. And unfortunately I'm, I'm using a camera that looks a little too much like a rocket launcher um, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in Taliban country. Uh, um, I was never shot at, but you know, uh, from a distance, I think that's uh, what, it, what it looks like. Um, I work for a, ra ra a wide range of outlets like National Geographic Channel, PBS, um, Al Jazeera, New York Times, CNN. Um, and as, as James said, I do a lot of international work, working in Afghanistan, Pakistan, many countries in Africa and in, in China. Um, uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, documentary um, journalism. Um, which I really see as kind of the, the preeminent home for um, uh, investigative journalism kind of in our modern, modern era. Um, so I'm going to be talking about documentary journalists working on the front line and mainly the, the topics of exposing corruption, protecting human rights uh, and environmental issues, um, and saving cultural heritage. So why, why documentary journalism? Why is documentary journalism maybe the, the best way to to tell a story, to get a reaction from an, an audience, to, to have an impact. Um, and I'm sort of outlined some, some reasons. Um, my, my biggest one is that um, a documentary can make a, a kind of cold, hard, factual news story emotional. Um, it can make it resonate for an audience. And I'm a big believer that if a, a film that you watch, whether it's a fiction film or a documentary, can make you feel something, can make you cry, can make you angry, um, it's an, it, it sort of ceases to become just a film, and it starts to become an experience, um, a learning experience, a, a real thing that's happening to you. And um, for me personally, and I sometimes, I'm kind of a crier, I get emotional at, at films and cry at films, um, but for me, if I, if I do sort of cry at a film, it's an experience that I'll never forget, that I'll take with me forever, for the rest of my life. And for me, that's, that's very powerful. Um, you can make a complex issue um, something understandable and, and personal um, through intimate portrayals of characters. And this kind of means um, you can take something large like um, the humanitarian crisis in Syria and make it, make it personal, tell a small story that reflects the wider, the wider issue. Um, you can really make something that's immersive in a, in a foreign situation. Um, and I think that's, that's especially important for American audiences. I'm from Chicago. Um, uh, right now, American audiences are very uninterested in, in, in very uninterested in international topics. They're very interested in kind of insular stories. So in Chicago, they're interested in Chicago stories. So you have to sort of sell them on an international story um, and immersing them, really making them feel a story, feel like they're a part of it. Um, f you know, feel like um, they're surrounded by the topic. I think uh, is very helpful. And in that too. Um, documentary can break stereotypes. Um, so I, I grew up in, in Ohio, in rural Ohio, in farming country, and um, when my family members see that I'm working in Afghanistan or Pakistan, um, they literally think that everyone in Afghanistan and Pakistan is either a terrorist, so that there's like, you know, millions of terrorists just everywhere, you know, living in the country, or they're these victims of terrorism, you know, like, a, a crying mother that's, you know, weeping over their lost child or, or something. So it's very important that documentaries break those, those really shallow stereotypes and tell, you know, an inside human story. Um, uh, in, and oftentimes in the subject's own words. So it's not, um, my films are, are, are always like this, that the subject of the film tells the story. It's not really me telling you the story. Um, 
and I sometimes use the, the, the analogy or the metaphor of a, of a fishbowl. Um, you know, sometimes uh, t TV news or um, sometimes print journalism will tell a story um, as if you're a, a viewer looking into a fishbowl, looking you know, through the glass at a, at a story. And for me, it's really important, and in, in, in documentary, I think achieves this, is to not tell the story outside the fishbowl, but to get inside the fishbowl with the fish um, and tell the story you know, from the, the fish's perspective, from, uh, from the fish's world. Um, right now, for, for documentary, cameras are much smaller. Uh, Post-production is much cheaper than, than it's ever been. It's much more um, attainable for a, a, a larger um, number of users to make a documentary film. Um, and then there, there's quite a lot of precedent right now um, where documentary um, films have made a real impact, have actually made substantial change. Um, uh, an in inconvenient truth about uh, Al Gore's um, climate change talk is a good example. Blackfish, um, how many people are, are familiar with the film Blackfish? One, one person? Two, a couple of you. <laughs> Um, a couple people, okay, so um, Blackfish is about um, uh, the captivity of killer whales and about SeaWorld, and Blackfish is, has actually been, in, in a lot of ways, single-handedly taking down um, SeaWorld as a uh, corporation. Um, and just last week they announced that they would be ending um, their, one of their killer whale show, shows in uh, San Diego. So it's having sort of real, real impact. Um, in a substantial, you know, measurable way. Um, and documentary film has never been more, more popular. Um, documentary films now really d dominate the landscape on television and online. Uh, and they're often the, the kind of bragging centerpiece point for a lot of, a lot of outlets. Um, so HBO documentary films, um, CNN now has an arm called CNN Films where they focus on documentary. Discovery Channel, National Geographic, Showtime, um, has now um, put a lot of money and a lot of pr uh, programming space into documentary. PBS, um, Al Jazeera America, which is Al Jazeera's uh, kind of American standalone um, television network, Al Jazeera English, New York Times. And then digital outlets like Netflix and Amazon have um, given documentary a major push. Well, actually, see, I'll, I'll show some examples. Um, where Netflix actually, you know, brand, brands documentaries, a, net, a Netflix film or a Netflix documentary. Um, uh, National Public Radio in the U.S. Has, has recently stated we're in a golden age of documentary film, um, especially on television, not only in the production of documentary films, but in, you know, big audiences responding to the film, watching, watching the film. Um, and then there's been an increase in documentaries um, shown in the theaters. Uh, as well. Um, at the same time, we're seeing sort of vanishing um, print journalism and photo journalism in a major, major way. Um, there were sort of maybe not shocking, but um, substantial layoffs at uh, National Geographic and their photography department um, just this month. Um, in an interview with the New, New Statesman documentary filmmaker uh, Joshua Oppenheimer, who makes documentary films or made a series of documentary films examining the genocide of over a million people in uh, Indonesia um, in the act of killing and um, a companion film called The Look of Silence said, um, to, to quote this, I think one of the problems is that genuine investigative journalism has been so eviscerated, so underfunded, um, particularly in the United States, that nonfiction filmmakers must fill that, fill that space. Um, some, some of our greatest talents are doing great works um, that are fundamentally what traditional journalism um, should be doing. So we, we kind of are witnessing this evolution um, away from print and photojournalism into um, this immersive on the ground documentary filmmaking. So I'm, I'm actually going to talk about three outlets, um, CNN Films, HBO Docs, and the New York Times, um, and sort of their t um, success with documentary films. So Blackfish, the film that I talked about examining SeaWorld and um, killer whale captivity, um, premiered to 1.5 million viewers. Um, and that's just the premiere on CNN, um, as, as maybe you're aware of in, uh, on American um, television, films are oftentimes rebroadcast over and over again. So um, just in its premiere, it, it, 
it saw over 1.5 million viewers. Um, and this is, like I said, has, has led to kind of significant um, impact. Um, Life itself about the Chicago um, film cri critic Roger Ebert premiered to over 500,000 viewers. Um, Dinosaur 13, which is other images from premiered on, on CNN films to over 300,000 viewers. Um, HBO documentaries, um, which are very well funded. Uh, um, there is always kind of an enormous, enormous outreach and social uh, media impact to the, the documentaries. Um, they've been st sort of a, this fantastic place to premiere a documentary film. Uh, two, two films in particular, that the posters are here, um, that had significant impact and viewership. Um, Alex Gibney's documentary called Going Clear um, about Scientology. Has anybody seen Going Clear? In here, a couple, one person. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Going Clear is a expose about uh, the, the religion, Scientology, um, shockingly told from the inside. So actually, um, high-level members, high-level sci Scientology members um, from with, within the church basically tell the story of Scientology's wrongs, and um, uh, it, it's a pretty incredible film. It premiered on HBO to nearly two million viewers on a Sunday night in March, which is um, interesting. And then, like I said, these films get um, rebroadcast. Um, uh, Andrew uh, Jarecki's documentary, The Jinx, The Life and Deaths of Robert Durst, was viewed by over a million times. Um, in this, this actually was a series of documentaries. I think there was three in the series. Um, and what's sort of incredible in the film, uh, just like I'm mic'd up here with a, with a wireless mic. Uh, in documentary films, it's um, uh, very popular to mic the subject where the microphone is hidden, so you actually wouldn't see the microphone. Um, and Robert Durst was a, sort of accused of these terrible crimes, but had um, uh, uh, never been prosecuted for, for these crimes, um, and the film was sort of following his life um, what he did though, you see he had one of these wireless mics on and he went to the bathroom. And for whatever reason, um, the filmmaker was still recording. Uh, <laughs> which, right, yeah, somebody said, come on, right? That seems a, a little unfair, I, I agree. Um, but unlike my setup, the microphone was hidden. So oftentimes people will forget they're, they're mic'd, you know, if it's out of, out of sight, out of mind. So as he's in the bathroom, you know, using the bathroom, he confesses to the murder. Just talking to himself, he confesses. Um, it, it's incredible. Yeah, he, he actually he says, "Did I did I kill those those people? Of course I did." Is what he says in the in the bathroom. Yeah, it's 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 incredible, and that became part of the film. And it's, as soon as that premiere episode of of this film played on uh, on HBO, um, first degree murder charges were brought on him, and he was arrested. So so fairly incredible. I'm not here to defend the, f the filmmaker's um, ethics because I think there's, there's definitely a lot of questions to ask, like why did they wait until the film's premiere to expose this material, right? Um, and they have their own rationale for that, but I, I think that's fairly significant. Uh, and then the New York Times, um, especially in their OpDocs program, has put significant money and energy into documentary films. Um, they claim that video is, a, is booming across the media industry. Um, people are watching more videos online, on their, on their phones, more documentaries. Um, the OpDocs program is significant because uh, it, it is short form documentary um, filmmaking, so often um, up to seven minutes short films um, by big name directors like Errol Morris, Laura Porteous, uh, Allison Clayman. Um, I did a short OpDocs for my Saving Me Sinak um, film as well. Um, they get a lot of views, and it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a very intelligent, engaged um, audience. Okay, so um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I want to sort of highlight some areas that I think documentary films can make an impact, um, especially I investigative documentaries can um, <laughs> expose an issue, make an impact for an, for an audience. Um, how many people have seen Citizen Four? Okay, much, much more. Um, so Citizen Four, I, I uh, would, would argue, did expose corruption, exposed this sort of massive 
NSA um, spying campaign in the United States. It also introduced us um, to sort of the, the faces behind um, um, the story and sort of the, the humanness of the story. Um, Laura has went on to um, uh, work at the, the Interest, Intercept, which is a news website that's led by her, it's led by um, journalists, print journalist Glenn Greewald and uh, Jeremy Shahill. Um, she's just launched um, a, a um, kind of partnership with Intercept, but sort of an in independent project called uh, Depth of Field, which focuses on um, short, um, sometimes very lyrical, investigative documentaries. And here she's, Laura Portia says, our goal is to create a platform that responds quickly to the world around us, telling great stories with images and encourages artistic risk with a fast production cycle. Protecting human rights, um, uh, I want to sort of focus on this with a film called E-Team, which stands for Emergency Team. Um, and what this documentary looks at, it's pretty incredible, is uh, uh, Human Rights Watch, an international organization that monitors human rights um, around the world, um, employs these researchers which they um, send uh, in this project, which they call the E-Team, basically send these re researchers to areas where human rights violations are, are happening, and often very volatile, very extremely dangerous regions. So in, in Syria, when um, the government was accused of using chemical weapons on its own citizens, Human Rights Watch sent researchers on the ground, you know, in Damascus to basically do research to find out, is, is this real or not? Was this, was this happening? To interview people whose family members had been killed um, uh, to, to eventually craft a report that tells this, this um, complete picture. And I want to actually jump into the trailer here. Um, and as you see, actually, in this trailer, right away, Netflix has sort of brand this as an, uh, an official Netflix film. How do you feel when you're wearing it? It feels like invisibility clock. Or when you're traveling through checkpoints. It's a lifesaver. <laughs> Um, so I think this is a great example to show how they're, they're making what could be a very sort of cold, complex issue on, on paper or in a, in a you know, local news story or something, and they're making it very dramatic, very emotional, very engaging for an audience. Um, uh, and, you know, emotionally engaging, very, very personal. Um, the, the, the characters that you see here, two of them are a couple, and the, the woman that you see putting on the... Um, the, the, the burqa and the, uh, the hijab uh, in, the, in the scene um, is actually pregnant at the time and has uh, as a little boy at, at home. 
Um, so it, it tells this incredible story, not only of these humanitarian um, catastrophes happening around the world from this immersive on the ground perspective, but it also tells the story of um, these researchers who are risking their lives with kind of everything at stake to expose these stories to a big audience and to, to have, a, have an impact. Um, the next, next film I want to uh, talk about briefly um, that really highlights pr uh, protecting the environment and also exposing um, and fighting back against corruption is a film called uh, Varanga, also made um, last year. Uh, and Varanga is incredible for a couple reasons. Um, one is that uh, on the exposing, exposing corruption um, angle, they, they put hidden cameras on their subjects and have the subjects actually go into what I would argue extremely dangerous situations with a hidden camera um, to, to film people completely unaware that they're being filmed. Um, so it, it's, the, it's the story of, at its heart, um, these rangers and um, uh, staff that work at Barunga National Park in the, the Congo. It's actually the, the, um, the only place where there are um, jungle gorillas in the wild. Um, so it's the only place in the world where this still, still exists. And what's happening is a British oil company is trying to undermine the, the World Heritage protection of this nature reserve to basically drill for oil all over the, all over the park. Um, and because of the level of corruption, they're getting really far in that, in that process. And Varanga tells the story of, like I said, these rangers and also the um, staff that work with the gorillas at the park. Le parc national de Virunga, c'est la vie de la communauté. C'est dans cette entité là où vous pouvez encore trouver les gorilles de montagne. C'est ça ma vie. Ils ont l'amour. I think that we have a problem. Companies are exploring for oil. I came here to cover the security situation. I was sworn in to ensure that Warunga National Parks protected oil companies. I have a reputation for controversial ventures. All their efforts are focused on the national park. In the past, it has brought a lot of violence here. Everyone wants their slice of the cake. This isn't a war yet, but it could be soon. Companies are playing with fire. Fear has driven people out of these villages. If we leave, we would lose everything. The National Park is the only hope this region has. You must justify why you are on this earth. <laughs> Finalement, nous serons aussi jugés. Nous allons seulement croiser le bras quand le parc sera en train de disparaître. Pourtant, notre souhait est que ce parc reste immortel. I have to admit, like that, that that trailer gets me a little emotional. You know, it gets um, you, you can really see how they're they're making this story uh, emotional, telling it in this very um, character-driven, personal way. Um, and you also see, uh, I, I think, the the sort of emotional aspect of of the park itself, this gorgeous nature reserve that's being threatened, and also this the story of um, these. Um, mountain uh, gorillas um, that, as you can see, are, are very, very intelligent. Um, and the human beings really risking their lives to do the right thing, to try to stop this oil country, to you know, um, do everything in their, in their power to save this park that they love, to save these animals that they love. Um, OK, the, the last film I, I want to talk about is my own uh, documentary that, like um, uh, uh, James said, will actually show tomorrow. Um, I believe it's 6.30 in this room. Um, and I want to talk about saving cultural heritage. Um, 
And, and right now, uh, as you're probably aware, you know, um, ancient archaeological sites are being threatened across the, across the globe. Um, in Syria and Iraq and Yemen, you know, ancient cities, ancient cultural heritage that is part of um, all of our history um, uh, is being destroyed by ISIS, is being, you know, being destroyed or being looted from um, on, you know, enormous, enormous levels. Um, Sevi Me Sinek uh, is about a, a 5,000 year old ancient city in Afghanistan. It's actually a 2,000 year old Buddhist site um, on top of a 5,000 5, or older um, Bronze Age um, site uh, in Logar province in an area that's sort of famous for the, the Taliban's presence there. Um, and the ancient city actually was a Taliban camp at one time, so the Taliban actually literally stayed at this uh, on this ancient ancient city. Um, a uh, Chinese state-owned uh, mining company, the China Metallurgical Group Corporation, um, kind of like we saw in the Varanga example with an oil co uh, company, um, plans to mine the area in an open pit mining style, which would destroy the ancient city, um, destroy the environment permanently. Open pit mines are incredibly environmentally destructive. Um, would force local people out of the out of the area, and they want to do that for what's supposedly a hundred billion dollars worth of copper. So, enormous amount of money um, is at stake in the project. So, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this. I want to sh actually show the trailer quickly first. با ارزشترین و مهمترین کشف و کاهش هایی که ما داشتیم در مسینک بالاتر از همه چیز است ما فقط به خاطر از اینکه هویت و فرهنگ مردم خود حفظ کرده باشیم از اینکه کار چینایی آغاز میشه و یا از بین نره ما به خاطر این کارو شروع کردیم که حفظ شه Sinak to me is one of the most important sites of the century. The destruction of Sinak would be like Atlantis going into the ocean and disappearing from history. مثل ازی که یک مادر تفلش می مده As you can see at the end here, so this is, like I said, this is my own film. Um, and like the, like the other trailers I showed, um, E-Team, uh, Varunga, uh, and this film, I think with all of the examples actually having an, an impact, so an E-Team you know, exposing the sort of tremendous human rights violations happening in Syria and Libya, um, uh, and Varunga stopping this oil um, company from drilling in this nat national park, and for this film actually saving this, this, this world heritage, this um, ancient Buddhist city um, were, you know, in addition to telling, I think, telling the story and exposing the, the issue, were a, a very big part of the reasons for making um, the film. And I would say all the examples I showed had tremendous um, impact in achieving their goals and protecting the things. Um, and and this, this film has also had, I would say, uh, enormous success in um, if not stopping mining altogether, delaying, delaying mining, uh, um, and spreading, spreading the word about this uh, ancient city that um, really no one knew about. I think I'm running out of time here quickly. Um, uh, the last thing I wanted to just talk about briefly is there's so much work to do. There's so much for documentary investigative journalism um, to, to cover. Um, and you know, if, 
if history repeats itself, this will never change. There will always be these, this, this work to, to be done. Um, uh, you know, in, in Syria, tremendous human rights violations, cultural heritage destruction in um, Palmyra, the rise of ISIS around the world. ISIS is rising in Afghanistan. Um, these tremendous fires in Indonesia um, that are wiping out rainforests and, and killing habitat for you know, um, probably hundreds of thousands of um, species of animals. Um, Doctors Without Borders hospital um, bombing in, in Kundos in Afghanistan. Um, there's, there's so much still, still to do. Uh, and um, like I said, I think documentary filmmaking is the way to tell these stories and to have, a, have an impact um, uh, in, in saving um, cultural heritage, protecting human rights, exposing corruption. Um, thank you. Any, uh, I, I guess we probably don't have time for questions. Okay, um, but, but um, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>